Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, first video of the new year. I still have a hunting camp video from last year that I haven't got posted yet. So if you're a subscriber for those, uh, I will post another one here pretty soon from last year. Just haven't got, excuse me, haven't gotten around to doing it yet. Uh, so this video here, I'm going to talk about this machine that's sitting in front of me. Um, you know, normally I do what, hunting camp videos and um, I do home improvement videos. Sorry. And one of my other interests is doing leather work, um, making different things out of leather. Uh, for example, this is like a, this is a cell phone holster, you know, to carry your, your cell phone. You can clip it to your pocket, you can clip it to your belt. Um, and before uh, I got this machine, the sewing machine, um, it would take me anywhere from 45 minutes to an hour to stitch these up. Uh, because I stitch, I line the inside, and I stitch along the top there, all the way around, and then I fold it over, and I um, sew the uh, edges, okay? So you're talking about 45 minutes to an hour to hand sew that. With this machine here that I got for my birthday, thank you to my wife and my son, um, it takes me five to 10 minutes to, to sew that up all together. So a tremendous time saver. Um, now it's kind of hard to see the stitches on the red stitch, the red thread on the red leather. But here's an example of how this machine stitches. This is the front or the top. And then this is the back. So for uh, $90, well, it was like $92, uh, off of Amazon and I got the free two-day shipping this this is an excellent machine um, I'm not going to get into a lot of the uh, function and features and how to's on this on this uh, sewing machine just because there's a lot of videos out there already um, one channel I highly recommend uh, is a guy or his YouTube handle is mainly acres um, like M-A-I-N-E-L-Y, like the state of Maine, L-Y, Acres. And he's got several videos that are all excellent videos on this machine. So if you're looking for something I don't talk about, for heaven's sake, go over there because he covers just about everything. Um, modifications and how-tos and whatnot. Um, one thing that I did that's kind of different you know, and my own take on it is I, I made this table right here. Um, when you get this machine, this is all you get. This is the head, and then you go back, and here's the hand, there's the crank handle, and get it back around here, and that's what you mount the machine with or to. Uh, you know, you got the the mount holes there, and that's all you get. So everything else that I did here, like this uh, this press board, and two by six blocks that this is sitting on and, and this table right here this is all something I did um, and it's real simple real quick uh, I got some thumb screws here that will take apart take loose and then it just pretty much you got to kind of kind of finagle it like this that's your presser foot right there and then it just comes off um, sorry I know it's shaking around a little bit but this is the this is the table um, just made it out of half inch plywood and there's a two by six foot or leg to uh, hold this uh, left end up and uh, I topped it this is uh, this white piece right here this is called beadboard uh, it's basically fiberglass uh, you see it in um, surrounds in uh, bathrooms around a bathroom tub and whatnot and the other side is shiny and bubbly or, or beady so I use the flat side here um, 
Another thing that would really work well for making a tabletop is uh, if you know anybody that does any kitchen work, like installing uh, kitchen cab uh, cabinets and countertops. Um, normally, uh, when they install a countertop, they get the, the cutout for the kitchen sink. You know, a lot of times that just gets thrown away. So if you know somebody that does that kind of work, ask them for that cutout, that countertop cutout, and it's already got a nice uh, surface on the top of it that will uh, make a nice work surface for this this uh, sewing table. But anyway, I, uh, that's what I did. And as you can see here, this is how it mounts. These are called T-nuts right down here. Those are called, uh, like I said, T-nuts. Um, if you ever put any furniture together, especially something from like Ikea, uh, you've ran into those before so those are good to uh, put put a threaded insert into the end of a w wood block like I said I'm not going to go through a lot on this one thing that I do want to touch on or a couple things number one is this presser foot here um, if you're dealing with this machine you know that the bottom here is very it's got ser uh, serrations and they're very sharp and they will cut your leather up. And I tried a different, a couple different approaches. Uh, one was gluing sandpaper, or one was actually, first I smoothed this, uh, I smoothed the bottom of that presser foot out. Not completely, but I got rid of all the rough edges and made it look real nice. And, and uh, then it wouldn't feed, it just would slide, it would slide across the leather and it wouldn't feed the leather. This is a, a um, Oh, oh god i just had it but this this uh this presser foot here will move back and forth to feed your material excuse me let me get this in frame to move your material through the uh stitching process that way it just moves it at an easy um even pace so anyway without those really sharp serrations there it wouldn't feed the leather and so what I wound up doing is I first I tried gluing some sandpaper to the bottom and it worked a little bit uh, but I had a problem with the the sandpaper tearing so I got rid of that and uh, I went to the plasti dip this black coating right here is what's called a uh, plasti dip and um, it it's worked out fine you know you, I've dipped it a couple of times and it gives enough grip that it moves the leather, but it keeps the, the metal from the presser foot uh, from from marring up and cutting up my leather. So as you can see, there's no prints there, uh, whereas before there was lines on either side of these stitch lines from the uh, presser foot. The other thing I want to talk about is, like I said, you know, a lot of good videos out there talks about the different adjustments um, to do on these machines. The one that nobody talked about that I could see, again, uh, I didn't watch every single video online about this machine, but I watched most of them. And I, it took me a while to get this machine dialed in. Um, one is to make sure that this needle is facing the correct direction. It should, the hole should be in line with this horn right here. And, uh, if it's not, it's not going to sew right. And when I got this machine, this, uh, this, this needle assembly was actually turned and this screw was facing more like out towards me. And so when I threaded it, the thread would go in through the back and it, it just didn't sew right. And the other thing um, that there's an adjustment on is how deep this needle will go down into your your bobbin shuttle which is in here and catch the thread from the bobbin and what I was having a problem with was um, I had really loose stitches on the top and I this is your this is your thread tension here and one this should have two it's only got one I had to order another one um, I guess that's why the machine was thirty dollars cheaper than all the rest of them I saw, but I wound up spending twenty-five to get another uh, thread tensioner here, <clears throat> and that's going to help. Uh, still having some difficulties 
uh, keeping the thread from going back up behind this plate right here but I should uh, with that second tension disc right there that should help out but anyway what I was having a problem with was this top thread here was very loose um, it was big loops on the top here and the way I fixed it was one like I said I adjusted this needle to where the hole is um, in the same in line with this horn right here and the other was that I set my depth that my needle travels down inside here deeper and the way you do that is there's a flat head screw right here flat blade screw drive or screw head right here and you loosen that up and this rod it, you know it lets off tension on that rod right there and you can move it up and down so what I did is I used that to turn my needle so it faced the right direction and I set it so that it went deeper um, on the bottom down there and that fixed the problem um, and now it sews like a champ it's a little bit of a learning curve it's a very finicky machine but once you get it set up it's good to go and um, I haven't had any other problems with it like I said I, I just want another a second tension disc uh, because in order to get it to sew right, especially on this smaller diameter thread, this this tension disc is cranked down all the way. So if I had a second tension disc here, then I could just, you know, half the tension here and half the tension there to give me the same amount of tension and I wouldn't have this cranked down so tightly. Um, you know, the other thing that I did that I haven't covered is that I made a, a thread tree back here. Um, grab a spool of thread here. So your thread will sit down here and then you pull it up and feed it in this loop right here and then it comes across. Let me, give me a second here, just bear with me. So you put it through there and then and then it comes across and start you start feeding your end of the machine you start threading the machine and I'm not going to go into it like I said there's a lot of a lot of videos on this already um, the way this machine comes um, right here this this rod right here that's that's basically your your thread holder um, <clears throat> but you start getting a into some feeding issues um, with it sitting right there and you there's other things you can do you can get a bigger washer so that these will sit flat and whatnot but it really works well to sit down here in the back I'm sorry no I'm not in frame there we go sit down there in back and just feed it like this and it just comes up uh, really nice and smooth off of that uh off of that spool right there so in a nutshell that's it um you know if you're in the market for a leather machine a sewing machine and you're like me you don't have the two grand to three thousand for a really nice motorized industrial machine um and i know there's cheaper ones out there but the one that i want is close to three thousand dollars so for right now and for the foreseeable future uh i'm just gonna rock rock and roll with this i mean if you uh you've been look you know you do leather craft and whatnot and you've been looking at manual sewing machines uh, like tandy leather they sell that titman boss uh hand sewing machine and it's like 1500 bucks and it's usually gets terrible reviews um so less than a hundred dollars for this one and so far so good and once i got once i got it dialed in and got to understanding the machine and took care of a few of the customizations and whatnot then uh it's good to go oh one other thing before i go um all this metal here this is raw steel uh raw steel and raw cast iron 
<clears throat> and when you get it, it's going to be rough. You know, you're going to want to take some sandpaper to it, uh, some very fine grit sandpaper, even fine grit steel wool, and, you know, clean it up. It's going to come with what's a lot of what's called uh, cosmoline, which is a grease it's for shipping. Uh, you know, usually they pack metal parts and cosmoline, and it's a mess. Um, not getting too far into that because everybody else talks about it too. But when everybody else talks about is that once they clean this, um, they they put a light coat of oil on it to keep it from rusting. And you know, if you're doing leather work, you know, especially uh, a petroleum-based oil, that's going to get on your leather. Any oil is going to get on your leather, and you're going to get discoloration where the leathers come in contact with the uh, oil on this uh on these metal parts here don't don't use oil i don't you know don't don't do it um even lubricating these parts here i don't use oil i use uh, lithium grease a white grease you can kind of see it there there's a white grease on there comes in a spray can an aerosol can and that's what I use to lubricate everything. But definitely do not use oil on this to uh, preserve it, to keep it from rusting. What you use is Johnson's Paste Wax. Um, and I should have got brought the can over here, but I'm not going to walk over and go grab it and come back. So just Johnson's, just remember that. Johnson's Paste Wax or even Minwax. And... Uh, I've known that for years and years because I used to work in a wood shop uh, when I was a kid and all of our tools, um, like our table saw and planers and joiners, it was all cast iron uh, table tops and beds. And to keep it from rusting, we would coat it with Johnson's paste wax or min wax, let it sit up and dry to a haze and then buff it off. And it leaves no residue, and it makes it really s slick, and it keeps it from rusting. So don't use oil on your, your raw metal. Um, use, use the paste wax. And actually, the um, Johnson's paste wax, you can use that on leather. Um, I wouldn't, you know, like this, this, this here is called vegetable tan leather. And if you're into leather work and you're watching this, you know what this is. Um, <clears throat> I wouldn't use it on tooled leather. I wouldn't put Johnson's paste wax on something like this because it would accumulate in the tooling and whatnot, and, and <clears throat> which is not something you necessarily want. Um, but if you were to leave the leather smooth like this, jo Johnson's paste wax, would, you know, once you dye it, would give it a really nice finish, and it would make it. I don't want to say waterproof but it would make it seriously water resistant and it'd be a nice finish you know once you got done buffing it out so there's another added benefit of keeping johnson's paste wax in your leather shop but anyway that's it i'm done talking um video is long enough as it is any comments questions drop them in the comment section and i will answer thanks for watching